Amen. God has given us a wonderful privilege as people of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to come together on Sundays and be able to express our mutual faith, our love, and our worship for our Lord Jesus the Christ. And we praise God for that privilege. If you'll take the Word of God and open with me to 1 Samuel chapter 12, it's always a joy to be able to come and bring a message, no matter where it is, but a special joy to be able to bring the Word of God and to share what God's put on our heart in this place, in the Temple Baptist Church, our home, our home church. And we thank God for your love and for your prayers. I hope you will take the time today or tomorrow, the next few days, to go on to the church website and to be able to link with us there so we can communicate. As we send the letter, there's a place every week, every month when we send it out, where you can write back to us, and we'd love to hear from you. It's a joy to know that you're praying for us, but it's a special joy to receive word from you and let us know that you're praying. I was thinking as God gave us the opportunity to come this morning about the different times that we've been able to preach and remembering back. You know, there's times when you reminisce about what God has done in your life, what he's given you the privilege to be a part of. I thought about the one Sunday when we were preaching. It was in the other building, the old auditorium. I was working with the children in that time. And so I was out on Sunday morning. We had the Sunday morning children's service and then also for the young people coming in on the buses and had just a, such a wonderful time. But I was preaching on Sunday night. And I thought, just a young preacher, often you're so nervous about getting up. And sometimes maybe if you try to tell a joke or something like that, it helps you settle down, not be quite so nervous. And I thought about it for a long time, and I thought, well, there's a, a joke I'm going to tell before the, the service began, or before the message, and just try to settle in just a little bit. So I got about halfway into it on that Sunday evening. I hadn't been in the Sunday morning service or the, the Bible class that was in the auditorium that day. I got about halfway into that first telling that story, and I looked down at my mom. She's always smiling. She was sitting there at the time in the front. She's always smiling at me, letting me know, encouraging me along. What a blessing it's been to be able to grow up with a mother and father that have encouraged me every step of the way. Thank God for it. As I looked down, her smile kind of turned to a troubled look. And I could tell that she was a little troubled. She wasn't mad or bothered, but just a little upset. And I'm trying to think as I'm speaking, what have I done? You know, as it, I'm running to the end of this story to think, is this something I should be telling? Is there something wrong? You begin to think, you know, did I not get myself dressed right or what happened when your mother's looking at you and there's a problem? Well, I finally made it to the end of the joke and folks kind of laughed a little bit and you just try to move on from there. I thought I'm just going to leave that and, and get into the message what I should have done to begin with. After the service, I said to her, was there some problem? I noticed when I was looking that there's some problem. She said, well, you didn't know it, but... Brother Kaiser told that joke in the Knoxville Bible class. Brother Fox preached Sunday morning, and he told that same joke Sunday morning. And when you started in it, I thought, surely it can't be the same one. But it happened. And so I've learned, let's just stay away from the jokes. When we come together around the Word of God this morning, and my heart and mind have been going this week, racing, of course, all the things prepared to be ready to go. But you can't help but reminisce I had the privilege yesterday to sit with our family together, and my mom and dad, my grandmother, and listen and reminisce about what God's done in ministry down through the years. Dad shared with us about times of ministry when he first began preaching. He began to talk about what God had done in Greenback, in Lenore City, in Chattanooga, Patterson, New Jersey, and then here in, in Powell. All the ways that we've seen the Lord work. What a blessed time it was just to sit and have our hearts thrilled once again as we relive those moments when God was evidently and obviously at work. We praise God we have those memories. And I know one of the things that I counted a great joy was that my children were sitting at the table. And they heard about the stories of how God has worked. It's wonderful to hear about the past. We know, though, the past is not the only thing we can rely on, that we've got to move forward. Every generation has to be put to the test. Their faith has to grow. It has to stretch. But we praise God that we can have those stories of faith to pass on to our children. There was a time in the nation of Israel when God was their king. And in looking back at the nation of Israel, there's so many things that we can learn. We understand the church is not the nation of Israel, but there's a great lesson that can be learned as individuals when we reminisce with them about the things that took place in their world and in their life. We come to 1 Samuel chapter 12, and of course what's taken place 
is that God had answered the desire of the nation of Israel. They said, we want a king. Interestingly enough, God was speaking through his prophet Samuel. We find an interesting verse. But as we reminisce here with the nation of Israel, we walk back through their history. We think about times in our own lives, and perhaps mistakenly, or perhaps it's in truth, we always remember the great times. We think about the good old days, when everything at least seemed like it was the way it was supposed to be. And this morning, I'd like to call your attention just to one verse, and then we'll go back and walk our way through the chapter. But in 1 Samuel chapter 12, and verse 12, the Bible says, And when ye saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you, ye said unto me, Nay, no. So the children of Israel are saying to Samuel, No, nay, but a king shall reign over us. They're saying to Samuel, We saw this king of the Ammonites, and we've seen the different kings that are around us. And Samuel's speaking to them about the Lord, and they said, No, we will have a king reign over us. And Samuel gives us here the heart of the Lord, as he records for us under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, and he says, when the Lord your God was your king. It's an amazing thing to think back that there was a time on this earth when physically and literally there was a kingdom of people when God was their actual king. This morning for just a few moments I'd like for you to take those words and perhaps you do what I've done in your own Bible or in notes write down this title this morning, When God was King. When God was king, in our nation we watch folks as they're vying now for a nominee to be able to be elected president. People will stand behind a pulpit and they'll have folks gathered behind them for the most part who agree with everything they're going to say and they make promises. They talk about the nation that was and if there's ever a time when we need to enter into this election cycle in a time and period of prayer where our hearts are right with God and we're seeking the will of the Lord. We're doing all that we can to influence this nation for the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that it's now. But in listening to all these folks talk, my mind went back and I found this verse. And it reminded me when the Bible says there is a time on the earth when God was king. Can you imagine what that would be like? Can you imagine if in America today we actually had folks who were able to stand and say that God has a desire for this nation and here's what His desire is. Well, friends, we know God does have a desire for this nation. There's things that we can learn from the period in this history when God was king. The first thing we go back, and I want you to consider this morning, was, well, what was that like? What was it like to actually live when God was your king? Samuel here gives a few ideas. If you'll look back with me in verse 7. The Bible says, Now therefore stand still, that I may reason with you before the Lord of all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and to your fathers. The first thing that Samuel calls her attention to is when God was king, God did everything right. It was always righteous. The Bible tells us that God, who cannot do unrighteousness... God cannot do anything that is not right. It's impossible. Imagine living under the rule of someone that you knew everything that he said, every desire that he had, every wish that he wanted us to live by, every rule, everything that came down the line to us as individuals was right. What a privilege it would be to live. Imagine being able to go to someone in this world and say, I want to bring you into a place where you can actually willingly put your life under the rule of someone that will never lead you astray. Never. Every word they speak, you can guarantee that it's the truth, that it's a fact. You don't have to try to get folks to research it. You don't have to wonder if they've hidden certain things or they've wiped things clean. What we know is that it's always right. What was it like when God was king? Well, what it was like was everything was always done right. The king always did what was right. The second thing that Samuel shows as we continue, the Bible says in verse 8, when Jacob was come into Egypt, and your fathers cried unto the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, which brought forth your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. What was it like when God was king? It was a day and age when people saw the power of God. Egypt was the mightiest nation in all the world at the time. 
What God did, He took the nation that was the greatest nation in the world and He humbled it. He destroyed all the things they worshipped as gods. And He showed that there was only one true and living God. The people were able to look around and with their eyes they could see while they worshipped the mighty Nile, it was turned to blood. They would worship different things, even coming all the way down to worshipping their own children. And God said that those children were not to be worshipped. When we see what God did here, we understand when God was king, His power was evident all around. The Bible goes on and it tells us, we can read through the New Testament, that the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. We listen to so many folks talk and they talk what they would do for this country, what they will accomplish, what they hope to do. And perhaps someone would say, I'll make the borders more safe or I will create jobs, I'll increase the economy. No one in the world would be able to stand and say that they can do the things that God has done. When God was king, you could look around and you could see that it, weren't just, it wasn't just empty words. God was not just making promises and saying things that he couldn't fulfill. But everything that was taking place, you could look and you could see the actions of God himself. Who split the Red Sea? Well, no one could stand and say, look at what I've done. God did it. Who provided shoes where they could walk for 40 years? Moses couldn't stand and say, can you believe what I've been able to do with your shoes? No, God did it. Who provided manna that they could go out in the morning and pick it up? It was the power of God. Who provided meat for them to eat? Even when they were complaining, God said, well, I'll give you this. Who could bring water out from the rock? It was God alone. When God was king, there was a power that was evident in people's lives. The Bible tells us that even today, it's the same desire. God desires to rule and reign in our life, and He has given us the same power. The Bible says that it's the gospel. It's the good news. It's the power of God unto salvation. When we meet people today, we go back and we can reminisce about a day when God was king. We say to folks, you know what it was like? It was like that God was able to do everything right. But I'll tell you something else it was like. When God was king, folks looked around and they saw God at work. He was powerful. He was demonstrating himself. God never just says empty words, but he came in power. We can share with folks in our life how the power of God, the gospel message, has demonstrated itself in our life and what God has done to prove himself through his word and through his people and through the good news of Jesus Christ. What was it like when God was king? The Bible goes on and says in verse 9, And when they forgot the Lord, their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, captain of the host of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. And they cried unto the Lord, and he said, and said, We have sinned, because we have forsaken the Lord, and have served Balaam and Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies, and we will serve thee. What was it like when God was king? You read these words, and be honest, as a pastor or a preacher bringing this message, you say, well, do we want to just kind of skip over that? He sold them as slaves. So what do we do when God was king? What this says to me is it was a time of compassion. He actually cared. You say, well, he cared, so he sold them as slaves. What were they doing? They were destroying their lives. Take time to go home. I don't have the opportunity this morning to explain it all. And in a mixed audience with children here and men and women, in a public way, I couldn't explain the worship of Ashtaroth and Balaam in a way that we could even listen. It would be too embarrassing. These people had taken their bodies and their children and their daughters... And they were offering them in practices that were destroying even who they were as a people. They were destroying themselves. When God was their king, he looked at them and he said, I love you too much to let you just continue doing this. I care too much. I want you to stop destroying your life. And he allowed them to go through times of hardship so that they could get their priorities straight again. In our lives, I think if I were to ask you, how many of us have gone through times in our lives when we say, well, Lord, I don't understand this hardship as I'm going through it. But when we get back, at least at this point in our life, we can look and we can see, had it not been for that time of trial and testing, Amen. where would my life have gone? What would have happened? When God was king, it was a time of compassion. He actually cared. He cared so much that he would not let them continue to destroy their homes, destroy their lives. He intervened and acted. 
When God was king, the Bible says in verse 11, and the Lord sent Jerubbabel and Bedan and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side and you dwelled safe. When God was king, we were delivered. Who delivered them? Let me ask you, who delivered them from their enemies? Who did it? God did. When God was king, when they needed help and they humbled themselves, and they came before the Lord and they said, we know it is our fault. We accept the responsibility. We have sinned against you. And they called out on the mercy of God. And God demonstrated his mercy and he delivered them. When God was king, he delivered them. I believe there's folks sitting here this morning who say, you know, preacher, I've gotten myself into this and I don't know how to get myself out of it. We've all found ourselves there at some time. When God is king, we don't have to know how to get ourselves out. What we have to do is humble ourselves. We have to be willing to come before the Lord and say, I know that I've sinned. I know, though, that you are a God of mercy. Do you remember the great missionary of the Old Testament, Jonah? God said to Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, that great city. I want you to preach. I want you to tell them my judgment's coming. And what did the missionary say? I always found it so interesting. He says, I don't want to go because I know what kind of God you are. When I preach the message, they'll repent of their sin, they'll turn to you, and you'll forgive them. And he said, I don't want to go and take the message. Can you imagine? Imagine we had him visiting the mission conference and that was the message he preached. But here we think about our God. He's a God that delivers when God was king, he delivered them and he let them live in safety. The Bible goes on then in verse 14. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. When God was king, God gave them second chances. The people had said, we've turned, we've sinned. Even later on in the chapter, they said to Samuel, we know that even asking for a king, we've sinned against God. Imagine the heart of God. God gives us all the, the scriptures and shows us into his heart and mind. The Bible talks of God's broken heart, his anger, his emotions as he looks down at his people. Here Samuel says to the people, when God himself was your king, you said to me, no, we don't want him, we want someone else. When God was their king. And here instead of God saying, well, you've got your choice, now you deal with it. When the people came back to God and said, we know we've sinned, God said, well, I'll give you another chance. And we find in verse 14, he says to them, if you will fear the Lord... You see, when we take a wrong turn, it doesn't mean that everything's completely finished forever. When we come back to the Lord, God doesn't look at us and say, well, you know, you went off that one way, now just stay gone. Don't ever show your face around here again. When we return, the Lord says, let me tell you what I'd like to do. He said, if you will fear the Lord. What does it mean to fear the Lord? The Bible tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's where it all starts. When we come back to the Lord and we put him in his rightful place, Jesus said it like this in the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name, set apart from everyone else. We know there's no one like you. When God was king, he said to the people, when you've gone astray, you return to me. If you want to live for me, then first put me back in the rightful place. Jesus said it again like this, the greatest commandment, if you will love the Lord your God with everything that's in you, all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. If you'll put God where he belongs, then you can follow the Lord. If you will fear the Lord. The Bible goes on and says, and serve him. We cannot serve God the way we should until we've put him in the place where he belongs. When God was king, he gives us the opportunity to come back. We can still have a life of fruitful service. What would it mean to you as a Christian to think that we stepped aside, we we did something out of the way. We took a wrong turn. We sat in here in this service week after week. We came to the special meetings. And we listened as people spoke about what they would have us to do in service to God. But we thought, I can never serve God. No doubt if we've lived for much time at all, 
you've had the thought that I've gone so far astray that my life can never mean anything in service to the Lord. That's not what God has said. God is such a gracious God, such a gracious King, that He says to us, if you'll return to me, if you'll seek me with all of your heart, you will find me. And when you put me in my rightful place, then you may serve me. Service solves so many things in life. It gives us our life's purpose. Helps us understand what we're here to do. It helps deal with all of our selfishness and self-centeredness. You see, in a group like this, when we come together, imagine if everyone sitting here said, well, I'm not going to come to a church unless we sing the exact same song I want you to sing. Imagine everyone lined up after the service to say to Brother Gamble, now, next Sunday night, here's the hymns I want sung. Imagine if folks lined up then with the pastor and said, now, here's what I want you to preach about week by week. How can we all come together and dwell in unity? Because we're not serving each other, we're serving the Lord. When we come together, we say then, we're here to serve God. Whatever it would be, I'll lay my life down, put my will in subjection to you. The Bible says if you'll fear the Lord, you will serve me. The scriptures go on then and say, and obey his voice. You have to stop for just a moment. And if you would take a pen or perhaps write something down, take those two words, his voice. How long has it been since you've heard his voice? How long has it been since you've actually listened and you know that God has spoken to you? If we can't remember the last time when we know God has spoken to us, friends, something's wrong. I'll show you in just a moment where that leads. That's what happened with the children of Israel. God was not obviously right in front of them. They couldn't show up at the palace and walk into the throne room and see a physical king. And so they got to the place where they completely lost fellowship with him. But to serve the Lord and obey His commands, we've got to be listening. Obeying His voice. The scriptures go on then and say, And not rebel against the commandment of the Lord. Then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. God gave us as our king the opportunity to continue following then say, I'm going to send you out there and you have no idea where you're going. You have no idea what to do. I'm just going to put you to the test and see what happens. As we've been preparing to, to move far away, we're very excited about the, the privilege God has given us to go. But I'd be lying to stand here and say we don't have our apprehensions. As we prepare to go, God's been doing a work in my heart. God has said to us, as we've read through the scriptures, that we know Jesus Christ is the good shepherd will go before us. We understand that Jesus said to his disciples, as we go, he will go with us. The psalmist said in the Psalms that we understand when we go for the Lord, that he will go behind us and be our re-reward. He'll be the one that keeps us safe from the back. And I've held on to that promise as we think about the Lord leading us along. He says, then you can follow me. We don't have to step out into battle alone. We never have to step into a pulpit by ourselves. We never have to go to a door or into a home or into a family or into a meeting or into a doctor's office all by ourselves. We have the privilege of God going before us, God going behind us, and God going with us. God says, that's my desire for you. When God was king, he was a God of second chances. The Bible tells us when we look in verse 21, "...and turn ye not aside..." For then shall, shall you go after vain things, which cannot profit nor deliver. Perhaps you'd like to underline those three words, profit or deliver. When God was king, things were profitable. Let me put it as simply as I know how. When God was king, everything worked. People didn't spend 20 years of their life and look back and say, I've labored for 20 years and I've accomplished nothing. I've got nothing to show for it. I've wasted frivolously everything God gave me. I've got nothing. When God was king, things were profitable. What I invested my life in, our investments, they came to something. The seeds that we sowed reaped a bountiful harvest when God was king. We have the privilege of going into a world and telling folks how they can come to know a God that when they invest their life with God, it will work. 
Things will be delivered. There will be a prophet. We have the only message that brings anything of any value. But what we do is we find ourselves, much like the children of Israel at times, we look around and we just look for what we can see. God says when he was king, things were profitable. The Bible goes on in verse 22, For the Lord will not forsake his people. When God was king, we had a leader that we knew was faithful. Never forsake. Imagine, if you will, God trying to communicate to his people, the children of Israel. You've gone off and you've followed Balaam. Now an army has come against you. They want to invade. They want to steal everything that you've worked for. You've labored through the springtime and the harvest. And now you've reaped. You have all these things stored up in your barns so you can make it through the winter. And in an agrarian society, that's the only way you would live. The raiders came in and they would steal all that you had. You followed after Baal, and when you needed him, you turned around, and what was behind you? No one. Nothing. You were left with nothing. When God was king, you turn around and you say, you're serving the Lord, you're worshiping the Lord, you need God, you turn around, who's there? The Lord. He's not just there, but he's protecting you. God said you've run off after something that was empty. You've labored for something that resulted in nothing. But when God was king, he was faithful. He's there. He's always there. You never have to worry. Where will he be? He is always there. What was it like when God was king? It'd be impossible to talk about all the things, but that's just a window. Sounds like the kind of king I want to give my life to. Sounds like the kind of one I want ruling over my family. Sounds like the one that I want to say, I want to take my wife, my children, my parents, my nieces and nephews, my brother and everyone I know, I want to bring them under this rule. Because here's one that will always do right, who everything we invest in will deliver a prophet, who will take care of us, who will always be there for us, who will never forsake us. What a king when God was king. So what happened? What happened? Sitting here listening to all these things and think, who wouldn't want to be under that rule? Imagine if we could get a, a president over our nation who would live up to those things. Say everybody would want. Who wouldn't want someone like that to rule? What happened? Just like us, it's easy for us to look at the, the Bible and look at those folks in the scriptures and say, I can't believe what they did. They had to make a choice, the children of Israel, they had to decide would they live by faith or would they live by sight? They looked around them and what they saw was something that didn't look like what was taking place in their life. They got their eyes off of all the blessings of God, which is easy to do. They began to see the people who were around them and the kings that would lead their people. They said, we want to be like them. They got their eyes off of the faith and put it onto sight, what we can see. Here's what they said in verse 12, we go back and when... You saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you. You said unto me, Nay, no, but a king shall reign over us. When the Lord your God was king. Now therefore behold the king whom ye have chosen and whom ye have desired. Behold, the Lord has set a king over you. What happened? They said, we want to be like everybody else around us. Have we come to that same decision? You see, this nation, the nation of Israel, was a nation made up of individuals. It wasn't just one group that one group collectively said, here it is. Individual after individual after individual was carried away and said, we understand what God has done, but this is what we see now and this is what we desire. God allowed them to have what they desired. What happened? They chose to live by sight rather than live by faith. When we're going through the things in our life, every test, every trial, everything we deal with is a question of our faith for people of faith in the Lord. It deals with what we think of God. I would believe that that is the greatest question all of life, what we think of God. What will we base our life upon? There was every evidence why the people should say, we're going to base our life on the rule and reign of God. But what they said is, we just can't see him. 
and we can't hear him, so we want someone that we can see and hear. Friends, was that a good exchange? It wasn't. So what does it mean for God to be king? We look back and we say, what a wonderful time. We reminisce with them about a day and age when things were right. We see what happened. They made a bad choice. So what do we do today? The Bible says in 1 Samuel 12, 24, if you'll look there with me. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things He hath done for you. Can you stop this morning and say, God has done great things, not just for the Temple Baptist Church, not just for Pastor Sexton. God has done great things for me. May I see your hands this morning and say, I can remember those things. I know what those things are. How many of us be honest to say, though, even though God has done those great things, there's been times when I've made the wrong decision. I've been just like the children of Israel and I didn't realize it until I'd already made the decision. And I said, I wanted to be this way. I want a king. I want somebody I can see and I can hear when God was already there to take care of it. But I ignored him completely. I did my own thing. How many of us would be honest enough just like me to say, there's been times in my life, even though I know God has done great things in my life, I chose my own way. I said, I'll have my will and not yours. My hand is raised. There's been times like that. So what does it mean now for God to be king? The Bible says here, only fear the Lord. Friends, if you're here today, and you say, I don't know that God is reigning in my life. But if this is the rule of God, I want it. I want him to be in charge instead of me. I want him to be making the choices instead of me. Do you always know what is right? There's a God that does. Do you always know the best thing to invest your life in? There's a God that does. Have we given ourselves the things that when we turned around and we needed their help, they were not there to deliver? They were gone. They were empty. They were vain. There's one that will never forsake us. There's one who will always be there. What does it mean for God to be king? It begins like this, by saying yes. Lord, I willingly submit my life my will to you. What does it mean for God to be king? Put him in his right place and say yes. What's he waiting to do? Colossians chapter 1. The Bible says in Colossians 1 verse 13, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? It's all around us today, is it not? He's delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us. He's already taken us there. You say, well, friends, I'm living here in Powell, Tennessee. The Bible says we're actually living somewhere else. I don't have to be overcome with the power of darkness. He's translated us. He has taken us and put us in a place where it's safe, where he only could make us dwell in safety. Where did he take us? Translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, where else would you want to live today? Can you think of any other place in this galaxy that you would rather live than in the kingdom of his dear son? What does it mean for God to be king? If you're here this morning and you say, you know, I'm still calling all the shots in my life. I'm still the one making all those decisions because I didn't know there was another way. There's good news. That's what the gospel is. Friends, we invite you this morning in just a few moments to come to this altar here before us and let someone take the Bible, God's Word, and show you the good news of how to take your life and place it under the rule and reign of God. To say, God, I want you to be my king. To accept the gift of eternal life, the rule and reign of God in your life. There's others of us among us today, though, who'd be honest like the children of Israel we know that we've been put in the kingdom of His dear Son, but we certainly aren't living like it. When people meet us, we don't even have a good word for them. We're not even working with the people that we meet to tell them the good news. 
We listen to people everywhere we go. You can't go anywhere today without people talking about the darkness that's around us. And we listen as though we don't even have a message to tell them when we have the only message that would ever bring any hope. I ask you this morning, what does it mean for God to be king? They, the children of Israel, at this moment in time, they said no. No. If we go back and stand with them, we'd say, it's crazy. Why would you do that? Look at what kind of king he is. They said no. Will you say yes? I'd like for us to bow our heads in a word of prayer. I'd like to ask you this morning, when we think about who is ruling in our life, who is it that we've willingly taken our life and put ourselves under their rule, their reign? Are there friends with us this morning who'd say, Preacher, you're talking to me. I'm still directing my life. I'm the one who's ruling in my life. And I'd like to come this morning and lay my life down. If there is a kingdom you're talking about, if God truly will be my king, I want that for my life. I want that for my family. It says I'm listening to that. I don't know if there's ever been a time in my life when I've given myself to the Lord Jesus Christ and I've been moved, translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of God. You'd say, preacher, would you pray for me? I don't know that's ever happened in my life. Would you slip up your hand just a moment and say, pray for me. Anyone like that this morning? Pray for me. Thank you. Yes. Who else this morning? Pray for me. Thank you. Yes. In just a moment, we're going to sing what we call a hymn of invitation. We invite you to do something. You can walk out of this door having listened to the good news that God wants to help you in your life. Turn everything around. That He wants to be there for you. You can make a decision and make a change. Or you can walk out the same you walked in. We invite you in just a moment to come and let someone take the Bible and show you the good news. How many of us are sitting here this morning? We say, though, I know I'm living in the kingdom of His dear Son, but I'm certainly not living like that's where I am. You say this morning, I need to get God back in His rightful place. I need to get my service straightened out with the Lord. I need to be listening to His voice so I can obey. You'd say, would you pray for me? Slip up your hand with mine. Pray for me. Thank you. Pray for me. In just a moment, we'll sing hymn number 160. It starts with these words. King of my life, I crown thee now. Friends, don't sing a lie. If that's your desire, sing it out by testimony with all of our heart. But if you can't sing it and you say, I don't want to leave here until I can sing it with all of my heart, then on that first word, leave your place and come. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for all the things, this home, this family that you've given us here on this earth. And I pray you would help us to truly live under your rule and reign. The hearts that have been touched this morning, would you help us to step out by faith, to live no longer by sight, but to live under your divine rule, to say yes to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Stand with me, if you will. Let's turn to hymn number 160. Sing these words with all of our heart. King of my life, I crown thee now. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall thy glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn round brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane.
curse in just a moment. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for thee. You raise your hand this morning and you said, I don't want to leave here. So I've taken my will and I've given it to the Lord, given it to God. You may already be here, but you may be staying there. I want to invite you, find someone here. Don't leave this place without submitting to the Lord. I ask you to find someone here. As we sing this last verse, take them by the hand and say, I want to give it to the Lord.